Good morning. We welcome you to our 9 o'clock worship service on this beautiful, beautiful, bright, sunny day. First day of the week when we come together to celebrate what God has done for us. If you haven't uh, filled out an attendance card, I encourage you to do that. Pass it to one of the aisles and we'll have some gentlemen pick those up for you in just a few moments. Such a, uh, feels like spring for the first time, it does to me anyway. Um, Jim is starting a, a new series today called The Main Thing and uh, hitting on really the high points, the pivotal things about our faith uh, and our uh, uh, life in Christ. Uh, if you look at the scripture reference on the bullet on the front of the program, you'll notice that it's from Matthew 28, late in that chapter where the Great Commission was given. That is uh, truly one of the main things uh, for us. So we're going to be singing lots of songs today about taking the gospel to a lost and fallen world. If you'd like to, let's stand as we begin our worship. We have heard the gospel sound, Jesus saved, Jesus saved, spread the tidings all around.
Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for this wonderful, beautiful day that you blessed us with, Father. We thank you for the seasons changing, the warmer weather, Father. The just it's it's such a blessing to be able to be here this morning, uh, Father. We I pray over each and every soul represented here. I, I thank you for their willingness uh, to be able to choose to come here to worship you, Father. I pray that uh, everyone's heart uh, can put aside. Uh, other worldly things in this hour, Father, and focus uh, our our minds and our hearts purely on you. Father, I pray that uh, you be with, with Jim and with Mark and, and with the others that are part of this worship service. Father, I pray that you uh, speak through them and, and uh, use them to uh, get your message across, Father. And Father, once again, we uh, thank you for just allowing us to live in a society that lets us worship freely uh, without fear of persecution. Uh, Father, I, I pray that that continue. Uh, I pray for uh, each one of our nation's leaders. I pray for them uh, as they make decisions that affect our lives. I pray that they seek you and your guidance. And uh, Father, I pray that you be with our community and uh, our, the community surrounding ours. Father, I pray um, that you continue to bless us this country that we are so blessed to live in, Father. And uh, once again, just be with us throughout the rest of this service, and please help it to be uh, pleasing in your sight. In Christ's name we pray, amen. As we focus our minds on the Lord's table this morning, a couple of songs. Uh, this first one is very well known, but as I was picking out songs, uh, the version I found actually has a second verse that I had never heard before, and so I wanted us to sing it today. It's so meaningful, and I don't know how I've missed this over the years, but it's a beautiful song and a, and a beautiful new second verse, for me at least, assuming I sent the right file to the guys, so we'll, uh, we'll find out. We shall assemble on the mountain, we shall assemble at the Yeah. 
Just a few years after uh, Kathy and I were married, we were living in Grand Junction, Colorado, which is way out west, almost in Utah, on the western side of Colorado. And, of course, Thanksgiving was coming up, and we were, as several young couples, we were, you know, far from families. And there was one of the couples that invited quite a few of us over to their home for Thanksgiving, and we all brought a dish and, you know, had a, had a good day of food and, and very good Christian fellowship with our brothers and sisters there that worship, we worship together with and getting to know everyone a little bit better. And of course, a little football and some games and things. But uh, really, in, in a very small way, uh, that Thanksgiving was similar to Jesus' table. Uh, you see, Jesus' table is intentional. Jesus established it. His plan was to have the table ready for us for his apostles back then and for us today. And his table is inclusive. It includes all of us who are believers. And Jesus' table is also inviting. It's his table, and he invites us. Jesus extends that invitation. I want to read a few verses from Matthew 26. When it was evening... Jesus reclined at the table with the twelve. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to the, to the disciples, saying, Take this and eat it, for this is my body. And he took the cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, Each of you drink from it, for this is my blood which confirms the new covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive sins of many. Mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Let's pray. Our gracious Father, we are so thankful for this table that you have established for us, this memorial Father, oftentimes we feel like we're not worthy, but uh, we know that Jesus has invited us. And we, as we sung a while ago, that, that uh, you know, we are one another as we, as we eat this. Father, helps to think of, of his perfect life on earth, his sufferings for us, and his faithfulness for us, even to the cross. We are thankful for this bread, his body that's given for us. Father, help us this morning as we partake of this bread. In his name we pray, amen.
continue our prayer. Father, we're thankful for this cup, for this uh, fruit of the vine, which represents his blood. Father, that blood that uh, cleanses us each and every day. We're so thankful for his love for us, your love for us, and allowing this to happen for us. And Father, as we partake of this cup, help us to uh, really to gain new strength as we do this this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's pray together. Our Father, you are such a generous God, a giving God, and a loving God, and you take care of all of our needs each day. Father, you provide all that we need, and we are so thankful for that generosity and love. And Father, now as we think upon that and think about the responsibilities that we have to our fellow man, Lord, let us give with generous hearts so that we may continue your work throughout this community. In Jesus' name, amen.
Stand as we sing. There's a message true and glad for the sinful and the sad. Bring it out, bring it out. It will give them courage too. It will help them to be true. Bring it out. Good morning, church. Good morning. It is a beautiful day in which to gather. We're glad that you are here, especially if you are visiting with us this morning. Hope you feel like you are an honored guest because you, we, that's the way we feel about you. And we're glad that you're here. Hope you'll stick around following our worship this morning for one of our many good Bible classes. I always say just follow the crowd, look, look, follow somebody looks like they know where they're going because that's probably where they're going to one of our good Bible classes. And I should say, uh, we're starting a new one this morning, or Mark starting a new one this morning. Um, just imagine that hug. Did I get that right? You guys are going to meet in here just immediately after worship. Uh, so in addition to the slate of Bible classes that we have had ongoing, Mark is uh, beginning that new one in here. So uh, thankful for him and his willingness to do that. And I know that that will fill a need, or at least I hope it will, and encourage if you've not been a part of one of our Bible classes, come and be a part of that one this morning. Um, tonight at 5 o'clock, uh, this is the first Sunday of April, which is hard to believe. We are all back together here at the building uh, for collective service together. All of our small groups take a break and come back together for worship tonight here. And Ricky Pierce is going to be leading us uh, this evening and be talking to us about the work in Honduras and how you can be a part of that and uh, maybe give us an update on what's been happening uh, in regards to the mission there and uh, some plans for this summer that I'm hoping uh, to hear, that I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing about. So be back tonight here at 5 o'clock. I do hope your small groups have been going well, and if you haven't been a part of one of those, uh, there are, there's information in the windows here as how you can uh, hop in and connect with one of those next week. We'd love to, uh, every one of them has space, has room, and would love for you to be a part of, of their group. Um, it's uh, it's kind of getting real, I'll tell you, for me, and a little bit scary. Uh, so yeah, I, I told you guys uh, about a month and a half ago, a little bit more than a month ago, that in June I'll be transitioning into a new role working with uh, EEM, used to be called Eastern European Missions. And by the way, I want to thank our young people, our children and our youth groups going to be challenging uh, our young people to raise money to, to buy children's Bibles that will go into Eastern Europe uh, beginning here real soon. I hadn't talked to Terry or James this morning, but so your kids may be talking about that, and I appreciate them uh, being willing, willing to be a part of that uh, project. 
Um, but I, I talked to the elders just a couple of weeks ago, and uh, Sunday, May the 15th, will be my last official uh, sermon, will be my last official Sunday preaching. And, you know, it's kind of getting real. Um, I, I spent just a few minutes this past week going through some things in my office, and I realized really quickly what a big job that that's going to be. You can accumulate a lot of stuff in a small space in 20 years, let me just tell you. And Celeste has told me that it's not all coming home with me. So uh, uh, y'all pray for me as we, as we deal with that. A friend called me this, this, this last week, and he asked me, he said, what is it like being the lame duck preacher? <laughs> I laughed, I thought about that, I thought, well, I don't know, I guess I'm just going to keep on quacking, it's, it's all I know, that's all I know to do, and so that's, that's what I intend to do. Uh, this morning, I, as Mark mentioned, I want to begin what, what will be my last official sermon series, I do hope you'll let me come back from time to time, but I have, uh, I, I've been thinking about what sort of messages do I want to leave you with, what do I want you to remember over these last few Sundays, what are the main things, the main themes that I want uh, to, to leave you guys with? And so what kept coming back to my mind was Matthew 28 and Jesus' great commission. So I invite you to turn in your Bibles over there here in just a minute. We want to dig in again to this wonderful text. And, and I realize, you know, if, if, I, if you were to look over uh, all of my sermons over these last many years, you would find Matthew 28 pop up a bunch. Uh, just the last couple of Sundays, I've made passing references to this text, Matthew 28, Jesus' Great Commission. Why do I keep coming back to these verses? I, I, I know that in, in many ways, I'm preaching to myself. I say that all the time. I, when I'm thinking about what am I going to preach and how am I going to preach it, I really have myself in mind. What do I need to hear? What really, what really um, is encouraging and insightful to me? That's, that's, that's really first and foremost in my mind. And then what, what does everybody else need to hear? Because I figure if I need to hear it, so does everybody else. And so I keep coming back to this text over and over. These, these are the last words recorded in Matthew's gospel anyway. And in the narrative of Matthew, it seems to come very shortly after the resurrection. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, you remember, had discovered that the tomb was empty. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, told them to go and tell the disciples what they had found. And while they are on the way, Jesus appears to them. Greetings, he says. And, uh, and then in, in verse 9 there, then he instructed them to go and to tell the disciples to meet him in Galilee. And the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you till the end of the age. Why do I keep coming back to these verses in this great text? Well, I think it's because I, I, I believe that these words of Jesus are some of the most important words He ever said. Now, I realize everything Jesus said is important, but, but these verses give the marching orders for the church, if you will. They give us our instruction. These verses lay out for us our mission as believers and as disciples and as followers of Jesus. The, this is what we are to be about, to make disciples of all the nations. Go into all the world and make disciples. I, I, I believe making disciples, disciple making, is the most important thing that the church can do which is why I think, I, why I call it the main thing. 
Now, Stephen Covey was famous several years ago for coining the phrase, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And we would remember that. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. I, I believe that the main thing for Christians is Jesus' great commission to make disciples of Jesus Christ. That that is the primary mission of the church. And the secondary mission of the church is to keep the primary mission primary. To borrow that thought from Covey. That is the one question that the church must always be asking itself, must always be able to answer. Are we making disciples? That's the standard by which we will be judged. That's the standard by which we will rise or fall. Because because here's the thing, if we succeed at everything else, we've got great preaching, we've got a fantastic youth ministry, but we fail at making disciples, we have failed at the main thing Jesus commanded us to do. But now on the flip side, if we succeed at making disciples and the preaching, eh, you know, the youth group may be not as big as other youth groups, eh, but we succeed at making disciples of Jesus, then we have succeeded at what God has called us to do At the main thing. Now sometimes, and you know this, you've got a priority, you've got got one job, right? And it's awful easy to get distracted. You've seen pictures on the internet, right? You've had one job. What if you were charged to to, uh, paint the fire lane out, out in the parking lot? You have one job and you messed it up, or the fry lane, <laughs> I don't know. Or, uh, or the guy who has to, to, to do the, the, the line in the middle, you know, he got distracted, there was a squirrel halfway down the street. Um, or, I, I don't know if you can see this, but this is a, a bag of hamburger buns, but it of course says hot dog bun. You had one job, you had one job, how could you mess that up? Or, I don't know if you can tell what the, what's happening here. You, you're given the one job to put a rail on the sta- stairs, and your boss says, be sure that it slants <laughs> in accordance with the stairs, right? Or, uh, you know, the poor child who's going to get this, this little Disney animal here. You had one job, and you sewed the eye on wrong. Um, or, oh, yeah, I forgot. Now, this would drive me crazy. Somebody had to have done this one on purpose. I'm convinced, right? Can you tell what's happened here? (laughs) All right. We sometimes get distracted, don't we? We have one job, you might say. So walk with me again through this great text. And and, and, uh, this... (laughs) This may still not be the last time, okay? I've got six more Sundays. But, but I want to draw out some, some important principles that you may or may not have thought about here in this Great Commission. And one thing that stands out to me that I hadn't really thought about many times in the past was that mission really flows out of worship, right? Mission flows out of worship. This, that this occurrence happens right after they have worshipped, when the disciples saw the resurrected Jesus, just before He tells them to go into all the world, just before that, it says they worshipped Him. When they saw Him, they fell down in worship. And so it's in the midst of this worship that Jesus calls His disciples to mission. We see this in other places too, right? This is consistent with Isaiah's call to mission. Isaiah chapter 6, right? Isaiah tells of a vision that he had of the Lord seated on the throne, high and exalted, and he saw the Lord Almighty and, and, these, uh, and this uh, heavenly creatures flying around and worshiping. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. And it was out of this heavenly worship scene that the Lord calls out, Who shall I send? Who will go for me? And Isaiah raises his hands. Ooh, 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 send me. Here I am. Send me. Mission flows out of that worshipful heart. 
It is the natural response of experiencing the presence of God in worship. And I think this may be just another way of saying that that mission comes out of, flows out of of a life-changing relationship with God through Jesus Christ. It's, it's It's the natural response to being in the presence of God and experiencing Him and knowing Him. I've told you before that uh, about the words that hung over the, the doorway, um, the exit doors of the church that I grew up at, words that still stick with me, you are now entering the mission field. This was on the exit. And, and every Sunday and every Wednesday night of my growing up, going to church years, It was a reminder when I walked out of worship that I was entering the mission field. And and it it was a reminder that the mission field isn't just over in Eastern Europe somewhere or, or down in Honduras or over in Africa. Our missionaries, when I was growing up, were in the Philippines, and it was a, it was a big deal to get to talk to them. Every so often, uh, the, the deacons who were in charge of that would, would bring a shortwave radio, and we would, or I think that's what it was, and we would talk to our missionaries in the Philippines, and it was a big deal. You couldn't just pick up the phone, or at least I couldn't. But you don't have to be on that foreign mission field to be on the field of mission. It was a reminder to me, and really an education, that the mission field is right here, right right where we are. In fact, wherever we are, we're on the field of mission. And it flows out of worship. It flows naturally out of worship. Secondly, uh, the mission is to make disciples. Now that, seems, that, that may ought to go without saying, right? But, but it, it's to say the only command in these verses, and, and this was lost on me for a long time, and I know I've brought it up many times, but it was lost on me for a long time. But the only command in these verses is the imperative to make disciples. That's the context here. It's not to go. To go in the original language, I'm told, I'm not a Greek expert, but it's actually a participle. Literally, as you are going, here's what you're to do. You are to make disciples. You see, Jesus assumed His disciples would be going. From that point in Galilee, they would be going back to Jerusalem. They would be going back to their families. They'd be going back to work. They'd be going back to synagogue. They would be going to the market. They would, we live life on the go. That wasn't His command. His command was to make disciples. Which again reminds and emphasizes to us that, that the field of mission is right around us. Wherever we are, as we are going, we are to be making disciples. That's the command. That's the great commission. The great commission is the mission. And I, and I think it's telling, and, and you know, Jesus' commission was not to, for them to, to go and be a nice person. I, I mean, being a nice people, being nice people is great, but doesn't make disciples. His command to them was not, "Hey, go off and be successful at what you do." Success is great, but success at what? Doesn't necessarily make disciples, make followers of Jesus. His his instruction to them was not even necessarily, hey, go and invite people to church. Now that may be a very important first step, but it's just a first step. What his instruction to his disciples was, was to make disciples. The mission is to make disciples. I'd be willing to bet, I shouldn't say that, I'd be willing to to bet that many of us became a Christian because somebody discipled us. Somebody, Somebody shared Jesus with you. Somebody shared their life with you and mentored you and discipled you, taught you what it meant to be a follower of Jesus. Who was that for you? Who was that? Maybe probably many Many in our lives we could 
identify. Maybe a better question is, who are you that person for? Who are you that person for? Well, why, is, why is it so important to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? I think it's telling here in verse 18, back up just a verse, he, he prefaces that command with, because all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And I've always, I've always heard those, you know, I've read over those words is what I've done. I sort of thought, well, Jesus is just prefacing this command so that they'll know he has, he has something to back up what he's about to tell them to do, you know? It's more than that. Jesus has authority. What does that mean? Authority is a big deal concept in Jesus' time. You know, when Jesus went about healing and, and, and the Pharisees and the skeptics were put off by that, they all wanted to know, by what authority are you doing these things? They wanted to know where that came from. They also they wanted to know where it came from. In, in, in Luke chapter 20, they, they said, Who gave you this authority to do these things? To say these words, to perform these actions. Authority was a big deal. When Jesus went out preaching and his preaching sounded so much different from what the people were used to. Matthew 7, uh, the people, it says they were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. When Jesus spoke, when Jesus healed, when Jesus ministered and served, it came with a different authority than they were used to. When he healed a paralyzed man in Mark chapter 2, the people gasped and Jesus told them that he did it so that he, they would know he had authority on earth, even to forgive sin, to heal and to speak and to forgive and when he calmed the storm by telling it to be still, the disciples were amazed and they said, Who is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? Because Jesus had authority. Authority over even the natural world. Matthew 8 there we see he also had authority over the supernatural and the demons that he cast out. But authority. Folks, the mission is to make disciples of Jesus Christ because He has all authority on heaven and on earth, whether we acknowledge it or not. He has authority. That's why the Bible emphasizes confessing Jesus as that authority. Confessing Him as Lord, acknowledging Him as Lord. That's why that is so important. It's what Paul says in Romans 10, 9. Well, How? The mission is to make disciples. What does Jesus say about how we are to go about doing that? Number three, we see that the method to the mission is really twofold. And we can think of it as evangelism and teaching. It involves both. I think of it as a process. And baptism is just the beginning. It's just the beginning point. It involves both evangelism, and I think of evangelism as that sharing the gospel with someone towards, towards them reaching a decision to put on Christ in baptism. Sharing the gospel with someone until they, until they reach that, that point and, and then teaching them, secondly, teaching them towards greater maturity. I, I'm afraid we've often thought about baptism as, as sort of the goal of evangelism, you know, that, that, it, that we want to teach somebody about Jesus so that we can get them into the water, and then after they've gotten wet and, they're, and we know that they're saved, we can move on to the next one. That's not disciple-making. That's stopping just short. Baptism is, is essential, but it's just a starting point. That's why the Scripture calls it a, a, a new birth, right? A new birth. It's just a beginning point, a fresh start. It is, it is really that point at which uh, one confesses their faith in Jesus and surrenders to the Lordship of Jesus, puts their past behind them, 
their sins are washed away and they embrace that new life in Christ. But it is just the beginning. Peter would say, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, In His great mercy He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. But see, that's just the beginning. Birth is just the beginning of a life lived in pursuit of righteousness, a life lived in the footsteps of Jesus. It's not the end. Making disciples also involves teaching towards maturity in Christ, right? Teaching them to obey everything that Jesus commanded. You know, obedience here. Um, it's another aspect of discipleship I'm afraid we've maybe too often overlooked. Now, I know when I was baptized, I'm pretty sure I wasn't obedient to Jesus in every aspect of my life. I was obedient to Him in baptism, but, but I wasn't quite there when it came to, to treating others with respect or, or using my words appropriately or uh, in relation to, to greed or loving my enemies, or turning the other cheek, or come to think of it, I'm still growing in some of those areas. You know, obedience is one of those things that we grow in and continue to grow in. But that's the goal, like Paul says here in Ephesians 4, until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature become mature, attaining to the whole measure, that fullness, that fullness of Christ. And so the method to this mission is first of all sharing the gospel, evangel evangelism. That's what that means. Get, having people come to understand who Jesus is, they're ready to make a commitment to Him, but then discipling and teaching them towards maturity. We look at our gifts, we look at the, the ways that God has created us. I, I think I'm probably a whole lot better at that second half, at, at, at teaching and, and, and helping folks mature than, at, than at I am at evangelism. But, but I think it all goes together. It all goes hand in hand. And, and finally, this promise. The assurance of the mission is Jesus' abiding presence. And this is probably the best news. That Jesus doesn't ask us to do something He didn't do or that He wouldn't do, or that He was going to let us go off and do on our own, He promises to be with us to the very end of the age. That's His assurance to us. That He will never leave us or forsake us. The most powerful promise and assurance that I can think of is that He will continue to be with us. And the sign of this promise, the sign of this promise, of course, is His promised Holy Spirit to us who in John 14 he says I will ask the Father and he will send you another counselor to be with you forever or a comforter the, the spirit of truth the world can't accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you I will not leave you as orphans I will come to you Jesus is assurance is to always and continually be with us. His abiding presence, the this, this Spirit who guides us and leads us into truth, who convicts us of guilt and empowers us for the mission that God has prepared us to do. That's reassuring. Well, these are the principles. These are the principles that I have tried, I think, to emphasize throughout my years of preaching. Uh, th these are the principles that I keep coming back to over and over again. And church, these are the principles we mustn't forget. The Great Commission is the mission. Church, Jesus' final command must be our first priority. And, and, and this mission of the church must become the mission of every Christian and I don't mean every Christian is called to, to preach or even teach. There are a lot of different ways to share the gospel with, with others. There are a lot of different ways to mentor and to teach. 
But all of us, if you call yourself a disciple, needs to be involved in the process of making disciples. How else will disciples be made if disciples don't make disciples? And I'm afraid the church has not always done a great job at this. I'm not talking about Washington Street. I'm talking about the church universal. And I think that in some ways, uh, our, our lack of focus on the mission has borne the fruit or, or the lack thereof that we're seeing today where churches are closing their doors and Christianity is on the decline in Western culture. I'm afraid we've too often gotten distracted or substituted other things, maybe even some very good things, but, but not the main thing. We've substituted other things for the mission. Peter Greer and Chris Horst talk in their book Mission Drift about the tendency that they say is common to just about every faith-based institution to drift away from the original mission of the organization. Without careful attention, they write, faith-based organizations will inevitably drift from their founding mission. Is that true? Is that true? Listen to this mission statement from a well-known university. This is their mission statement, written in 1636. To be plainly instructed and consider well that the main end of your life studies is to know God and Jesus Christ. That's a pretty good mission statement, isn't it? Any guesses which, which university, if that's their mission statement? Harvard, Harvard University. Now, Harvard's a great university, great Ivy League uh, educational institution, but I don't think think today anyone really regards them as a Christian university living into this mission. Um, It was really shortly, just 80 years after this, that a group of pastors in New England decided Harvard had already began to drift, and so they decided to come up with uh, start another university. Uh, they founded a new school to be truer to their Christian values. Their motto was, whoops, <laughs> Lux Veritas, truth and light. And Yale University today doesn't retain very much of its Christian mission either. And I think they would tell you that. I'm not criticizing them. They're, they are a great educational institution But I think they would admit, no, that's not really their mission anymore. Now, I realize that um, churches are different from schools, but both of those illustrate what these authors call mission drift. This tendency to drift away from the original mission doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen after a single board meeting or a single set of decisions even. It happens slowly over time as other things take precedent. But I, 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 think, I think they're on to something. I think we've seen that in a lot of institutions. Folks, the church cannot afford to let this happen to her. That's why for every generation, the mission must be re-clarified and re-energized. Making disciples for Jesus is the revolutionary mission of the church. And it is a revolutionary mission. It's revolutionary in the sense that it will absolutely turn the world upside down. Like in Acts chapter 17 and verse 6, when the brothers there are accused of turning the world upside down by their actions. Well, what had they been doing? They'd been preaching the gospel. They'd been making disciples. And it turned those cities upside down. And he won't do it all at once. It'll do it one person at a time. One heart surrendered to Jesus at a time. One soul saved at a time. But it is a revolutionary mission. Do we need a revolution? Maybe the better question is, are you ready to join the revolution? This morning, if you have never surrendered your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, to the authority of Jesus Christ, we want to encourage you to do that. If you've never accepted Him and put Him on in baptism, 
that beginning point to begin walking that Christian life with Him, we want to encourage you. We would love to assist you in that. How can we pray for you? How can we encourage you this morning? If we can assist you in any way, won't you let those needs be known while together we stand, together we sing. Hear the sweet voice of Jesus say, Come unto me, I am the way. Hearken the love, call, obey. Come for me. Good morning, church. Uh, we are glad that you are here with us this morning. Please take an opportunity to take a look at the bulletin that is sent out or in the corners of the auditorium to keep up with everything that is happening today. We do have a couple of announcements here on the sheet that they've asked me to read. Uh, currently, Noah is in the hospital. Uh, we express our sympathy, sympathy excuse me, to the family of Clady Robertson, sister of Dan Mills. Funeral service was conducted on Saturday, April 2nd at Higgins Funeral Home. And congratulations to Eric and Christina Grobner on the birth of their daughter, Amelia Elise Grobner. Amelia Elise was born on Tuesday, March 29th, weighing 7 pounds, 12 ounces. Congratulations to, to proud grandparents Grant and Charlotte Bartelt. Aren't new babies exciting? Love to have that. God bless that family and that young child. If you'll bow with me, we'll come to a close this evening, this morning. Lord, we come to you today, we come to an honor and glorifying you in all that we do. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to gather this morning and sing praises and study your word, uh, spend time together in fellowship. We, Lord, that we, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his sacrifice on the cross. Lord, as we go today, we ask that you be with all those that are mentioned, those that aren't mentioned in our, in our announcements, Lord, that are struggling. We know that you know all. Lord, we ask that you be with them, comfort them, guide them, strengthen them. Lord, give them the ability to turn to you. Give them the wisdom to lean on you. Lord, we ask that you be with us as we go forward. We go into our classes this morning. Uh, be with our teachers. Lord, we ask that you be with us as we go throughout our day. In your son's name we pray. Amen.